Welcome to this um, Machine Controls Week 1 video lecture. This is Module A, Measurement of Electrical Quantities, and it is um, a little bit of review of your ELTE 108 and 109 uh, information that you learned. So here's what you do. You will uh, go down to the D2L and you would download uh, this PowerPoint. And then you would be able to click here if you had the PowerPoint and it will uh, launch that lecture. So you must have done that if you're listening to me right now. Um, you're going to have to pause this video every once in a while and return to the PowerPoint so that you can then follow other links out of the PowerPoint. There's a video lecture worksheet uh, that you would have printed off. And as we walk through this lecture, uh, you will fill out that video lecture worksheet right here, and you will turn that in uh, at the end of the lecture to the, to the lab instructor. And you'll complete the interactive lecture activities uh, as we go through this. So this is an interactive lecture. That means that uh, as I'm talking and then you're stopping and starting these other videos, hopefully you can work through some of the uh, the videos that are shown and get the same results that I am. So you're going to want to go and get a fluke a digital meter, a T5, a Simpsons meter, uh, two push buttons, two lights, and eight banana jack leads. So go ahead and pause the video and go ahead and get those right now. Okay, you're back. So what we're going to do here is go over our lecture outcomes, and it's going to be what are the main parts of an electrical circuit, what is the theoretical resistance of an open switch and the resistance of a closed switch, how are amp meters installed, how are volt meters installed in the circuit. The relationship between voltage and multiple loads in series, the relationship between current in series, and series, and also voltage and current um, for multiple loads in, in parallel and series. What's the difference between a conductor and an insulator? What are the different types of wire diagrams and advantages of each? What's the difference between a fuse and a circuit breaker? What is undesired circuit connection without a load called? So these are some of the items. Now, you're going to say hey, these look familiar because a lot of these um, you talked about are in 108 and 109. And so, uh, like I said, it's a review. Hopefully, um, you remember them and we'll reinforce them a little bit. So what we have here is an electrical circuit. An electrical circuit's got three main parts. You're going to get an electrical circuit if you have um, a voltage source. So in this case, I guess it's showing a battery. Um, and you have a load over here, and so that's uh, that's my resistance. And then you have conductors, so if you had wires um, can connect to it. Um, if, for example, you didn't have a load, and actually you just took a wire and you plugged it across, into the, into the wall into an outlet, or you just took a wire and you and you plugged it into a battery. Well, that wire, that conductor doesn't make a very good load um, because it doesn't have any resistance, and that wire would catch on fire. You would get current to flow for a minute, but then it would catch on fire, and then you'd have a problem. So those are the three main parts. Um, a couple of other things that are nice to add to a circuit are a switch so that um, you can control the load, turn, turn the light off and on, for example, and then a fuse or a circuit breaker, some type of uh, overcurrent protection in case you get an undesired uh, something going on with your load and that you want to break the circuit before you have a fire. So the three main parts are shown, but these other two items here, the switch and the fuse, uh, are, are usually part of a circuit. So now an overcurrent, we've talked about that, that's when you have excess current um, for the rated nameplate of the equipment. So usually you think about your house, you're turning on lights, so you're turning on a hair dryer or an air conditioner or something, you know, a lot of stove, electric things. So when, for some reason, that load or the circuit is seeing a current in excess of what it wants, then you've got an over capacity. Um, and what that can do is that can be a problem because the conductors, the wires running to that, the wires in the wall of your house are only uh, designed to handle a limited amount of capacity or amps. So if you get too much, then you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a fire. They're gonna burn up. So um, for example, let's just take a look at one right here. We have a 14 gauge wire, and that's uh, uh, could be a standard wire gauge running in your house. It's rated for 15 amps. Um, you would think about that as, as a as a white Romex wire, a yellow Romex wire would be 20 amps. But we have a 15 amp uh, wire, 
And under normal operating conditions, it says, what's the current draw of a 2,000 watt space heater? And will this wire work? Well, you remember your Ohm's law, I equals P over V. So we have 2,000 watts. Our house voltage is 120 volts. We get 16.67 amps. So this is a problem because the, the wire is only rated for 15 amps and we're uh, pulling 16.67 amps. So that's gonna be a problem. We would want some overcurrent protection so that the wire would not catch on fire. And by the way, that's kind of why uh, you might notice that when you get a hair dryer, a hair dryer might only be rated for 1500 watts instead of 2000 watts so that you can use it into your ba in your bathroom to dry your hair. 2000 watt, you would have to, you'd have to make some other arrangements for a 2000 watt heater. Your types of overcurrent circuits. Well, you have a short circuit. And this is um, where you're bypassing the load. Okay, so we're looking at our switch right here. So if for some reason um, the, the electricity went around the load, okay, well then that's going to be a problem. Um, you're gonna you're gonna get a short your short circuit there. It's gonna hopefully pop the fuse or the circuit breaker, and because you usually uh, want to go through the load, okay. Um, and then we learned about that there would be a grounding uh, circuit here, um, and that uh, we had ground that that's what that's designed for. Is the ground would take the overcurrent. Um, and hopefully protect you and, and cause the fuse to block to uh, to break there before uh, you got electrocuted. So uh, we have a ground faulted circuit. A ground faulted circuit um, is where part of or all of the current is flowing into the grounding circuit. And so what that means for a ground faulted circuit is that um, I'm sorry, that's what I was explaining a minute ago was that if you have one amp leave your source. You really want one amp to come back into your source. Okay, so if you have a, what I was explaining a minute ago, a ground, and the ground is taking some of the current away. So let's say you had one amp leave and only a half an amp return. Well, then you lost a half an amp. And that is a problem because that half an amp isn't supposed to be, uh, is, is supposed to be there. So that half an amp could be going through you, which would be dangerous. So we have um, GFCIs, which um, you see in your house, in your bathrooms, in uh, your kitchens mostly, in your, in your garage. And what they do is they say, hey, I sent out one amp and, I've only, and I didn't get one amp back. And so they trip very quickly. Um, an overloaded circuit is where the current flow is normal but the flow is higher than what it's rated for. So, for example, this fuse was rated at 15 amps, but if for some reason our load was that 2,000 watt um, hair dryer, well, then it's going to be um, rated, it's going to be drawing more than what it was rated for, okay? Um, and so, remember that when you start up, you'll learn, we're going to learn that when you start up a load, sometimes there's a spike or, you know, initially, um, even though the circuit might be only rated for 15 amps, when you turn something on, it might spike up like six to 10 times higher than that, but for a very, very uh, brief moment, and that won't cause the fuse to trip, okay? Um, and these uh, descriptions here are in the handouts for uh, this week. Um, circuit breaker or fuse. So fuses and circuit breaker are overcurrent protection. And fuses are circuit breakers have primarily one really important difference. Fuses um, get very hot, they burn up, and they blow, you know, I say blown a fuse, and then you discard them. And you have to then get a fuse and put it back. Whereas a circuit breaker trips by thermal or thermomagnetic, and we'll learn about the different ways. Um, but then you just come and you uh, reset it, okay? We will cover circuit breakers and fuses, and, and like we saw in the previous uh, slide, uh, GFIs and arc fault protection and everything like that in more and more detail as we get through the course, okay? Um, and so, once again, the difference here is, is if you burn up a fuse, it's more it's a little more of a process to replace that fuse, whereas a circuit breaker, anybody can just go down there and trip it, okay? Um, and so, either one is probably means that, you, that something bad happened that you didn't want to happen. You might have had a short circuit or you might have been drawing too much from, from your load. 
but the fuse is a little more deliberate reset than the circuit breaker, but they both work. Okay. Um, we have overcurrent safety devices, so we have fuses and circuit breakers that we just talked about um, that uh, we'll be using in this class. We have um, fuses, and we're going to probably blow up a few or burn up a few fuses as, you, as we go through here when you make a short circuit. And we also have a circuit breakers. The circuit breakers that we have for this class are um, rated at a little higher ampacity than the fuse that we're using. So when we make a mistake, you're probably going to burn up the fuse first before you trip the circuit breaker. Um, but, but you never know. You might do both. Okay? It says fuses and circuit breakers protect wiring first and equipment second. They do not protect people. So they don't, they don't understand that that... Uh, that overcurrent could uh, be due to you becoming part of the circuit okay uh, ground fault is what we talked about a minute ago where um, it senses how much current leaves a voltage source and how much current returns to the voltage source and it and it's really accurate if you just use a little bit of current here 5 ma and then it's going to trip very very quickly in about 1 40th of a second it's going to trip and and kill the kill the voltage so if you accidentally uh, touch something and some of that current flows into you that means it does not return back to the source and within 1 40th of a second that GFCI is going to trip and hopefully that will uh, save you and protect you. There's uh, some additional items in, that you can read about you'll be responsible to, to read about and that would be um, your arc fault uh, protection okay so be sure to read these documents on overcurrent. Um, and the first thing that we're going to uh, do a little interactive here is the push button. And so uh, we have uh, push buttons, and you've got one, and you're, and you're taking a look at that. What that is is a momentary push button. It's just a simple switch. When you push that push button, it changes the states of contacts. So I'm showing the NEMA symbol here. When I push this down, I get a circuit across between the contacts. And this is a normally closed uh, push button. So when I push the button, um, it opens the uh, circuit. So these are a little bit different than some of the switches you're used to. You In your house, you're used to like toggle switches that, you, that when you click them on, they stay maintained. These are momentary. You push them, and then as soon as you let go, they go back to where they were. So they're considered momentary because they return to a normal state, whether they were open or closed. So what you're going to do right now is you're going to stop this video and you're going to then click this link right here um, and fill out the worksheet for the to talk about the theoretical resistance of a push button. And you want to follow this because this is certainly part of uh, the quizzes and the labs that are coming up. <clears throat> okay. Hopefully you enjoyed that video. We're now going to take a look at um, ladder logic because we're going to be doing uh, quite a bit of ladder logic in this class. So this might be your first introduction to ladder logic. So ladder diagram is another type of electrical diagram. And, and all we're kind of doing is flattening out the circuit. Um, it doesn't depict electricity flowing in a circle like what we've been showing to where electricity left a, a voltage source and, did, and went in a loop and returned. It just shows that on the left here we have a rail, which is called line one, and on the right we have a rail called line two. And this represents that there's voltage between them. So if you were to grab left one with your, or line one with your left hand, and you were to grab line two with your right hand, well, you'd be in a world of hurt because there'd be um, voltage across there, you know, whether it's 120 volts or 240 volts or, or whatever. The, the ladder logic that we're depicting in this class typically is 120 volts between line one and line two because that's what this class is using for control circuits. So be careful, 120 volts between L1 and L2 is a fair amount and uh, it'll pass some, some amps and you can uh, certainly get bit by the electricity and we do not want that. So we have the rails. Now then we have the rungs. So this is the rung is, is where all the push buttons and ladders. So this looks like it has a circuit breaker going to a push button turning on a pilot light and we'll be learning about these so this is a circuit breaker so assuming the circuit breaker has not been tripped and 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 we reset it then it would be allow electricity to pass through the circuit breaker 
And then what we have is a push button here. But, so right now, this is a normally open push button, so nothing's happening. But if I push the push button and closed it, electricity would pass and it would turn on the pilot light. And because it's momentary, when I let go, it would return to the position shown, which is a normally open push button. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at um, some schematic and ladder diagrams for push button one and push button two. So once again, stop this video, click on this link. You're going to follow that and fill out your lecture worksheet. Okay, you're back. Um, we are now going to move on to the next circuit, which is an OR circuit. So once again, you will stop the uh, this video, look at your PowerPoint, click on the OR circuit, and fill out your lecture worksheet. <laughs> um, finally, what we have here is an AND OR circuit. And so you've done the OR and you've done the AND, and we're just going to put them uh, together real quick to, to be sure that you're understanding the concept. So this says push in momentary, and look at the parentheses here one or two, okay? So I'm gonna push one or two and three. So I'm gonna push one and three, or I'm gonna push two and three, and that turns on the light, okay? So I've got an or and I've got an and. So that is how this looks in ladder logic. And to do our truth table, zero, 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 zero. So obviously I'm gonna get zero here on the light, okay? As a matter of fact, if I haven't pushed three PB, then there's no way that this light is going to be on because it's not going to be true here. So in order for the light to come on, the three P the three PBs have to be one. So my conditions are either this condition, this condition, this condition, or the fourth condition. Those zeros don't count. So what do I got here? Zero, zero, one. So I don't have a path. I'm going to return to zero. We already know that's a zero. I got one and one. So by pushing push button two, I certainly do have a path around here, and I've continued to three, and I get a one. That was a zero. By pushing push button one, I've got electricity across the top, and, and I've got it through three, so I get a one there. That was a zero. And if I push all three push buttons at once, it certainly will turn on the light. So that is your and or circuit um, for uh, showing ladder logic with your truth table. Okay. We're now going to move on to volt and amp meters. Um, so what I'm, we're asking here is for you to create the electrical schematic component wire and ladder logic diagram for the following. Push in a push button, turns on a light. Then you want to put an amp meter and a volt meter uh, in the circuit to measure the circuit. And so this video right here, you're going to stop, talks about how volt meters go in parallel and amp meters go in series. So go ahead and stop. You want to watch that video. Okay, Ohm's Law Review. We're going to do a couple of these today. So you're going to be looking at how much current does a 1500 watt uh, hair dryer draw. We already did a 2000 watt. And what are the implications for this? Does Ohm's law directly apply? So I have, once again from Ohm's law, I equals P over B. So I would have 1500 watts over 120 volts, which is equal to 12.5 amps. So that's lower than what we uh, determined earlier for the 2000 watt hair dryer. Obviously, it's less. What are the implications for this? So 12.5 amps would uh, suit us uh, if we had a 15 or 20 amp uh, wire, tw uh, 14 or 12 gauge wire running um, in our house. Um, <clears throat> but uh, what else does this mean? Well, this hair dryer has, the hair dryer is gonna be made up of pretty simple. It's gonna have a resistive element that gets um, very hot um, and cre creates uh, heat, and, and it's going to and it's going to mimic Ohm's law pretty well. It's, it's, it just passes electricity through a wire that heats up. The other um, part of it is um, it's got a fan in it, and then that fan spins, and that fan is AC. It's going to be AC, and it's going to have an induction motor on it. Now, as you work through your ELTE classes, you're going to find up there's a big difference between um, AC inductive loads and AC resistive loads. So this 12.5 amps is not going to be absolutely accurate, but for our purposes, and, and if you're thinking about it, you can use Ohm's law to kind of approximate thing, 
approximate the amps here to get you in the ballpark of what the circuit, but be aware in the future that inductive loads like motors operate differently than resistive loads. Um, it's, and when you're applying Ohm's law to that, uh, there's going to be some variations. You'll learn quite a bit more about that, like I said, in, in the upcoming classes. Series versus parallel loads. So now we're going to connect two lights and use a multimeter, multimeter to measure the properties of these two loads. So this talks about um, how to uh, set this up and the implications of series versus parallel. So go ahead and stop and, and watch that video and fill out your sheet. <coughs> okay, meter types. So this class we're going to use a variety of different meters in order to teach the student how to um, do voltage, current, continuity, and resistance. We're going to use um, a Simpson's analog meter, which is a type 2 meter. <laughs> I'm going to, we'll study that in a minute. Um, a digital meter, uh, DMM, it's auto range. And you're going to, you're going to see this probably, probably the most. This is a good meter, um, general meter. That's what I have at home. A lot of people, people have these at home. Um, and you have a clamp meter. Um, which is a type 3 meter. It's a little bit safer here for measuring amps. So the, if you're going to stop and watch this video right here, this explains kind of the pros and cons of each of these and, and shows you um, how they all work. So go ahead and watch that and then fill out the, the worksheet. So here's our meter categories. We're talking about cat 1, cat 2, cat 3. So <laughs> cat 3 is what the, is what the um, DMM and the clamp on were. And the, and the key thing here is that these are used for three th three phase distribution. So when you go into a facility, manufacturing facility, you are likely going to see um, three phase power. That that's what that's what runs uh, those types of uh, factories and manufacturing facilities and power plants is three phase. So you need a cat three meter so that it is rated for the proper voltage at three phase. Okay. The Simpsons we said here was a cat two, and that's used for single phase. Okay. And we talked about some of the benefits of the Simpsons. You might be better suited for a laboratory environment as compared to an industrial environment because industrial, you're going to need to have a cat three meter. Okay. Ohm's law meter. <laughs> We've got some more, um, Ohm's uh, meter practice here. I got a little uh, worksheet uh, on your hand and your handout. Um, so go ahead and you're going to stop the video and watch the Ohm's meter practice video again right here. <coughs> okay. Um, we're back here. These are the um, items that you are going to uh, be required to know voltage, current, um, dire direction of current, flow, resistance, conductance. Alternating current, direct current, reactance, impedance, power, and kilowatts. So the worksheet that you have <laughs> has the definitions of these on there that you're going to memorize and that we're going to use in this class. So vert, voltage, current, direction of flow, resistance, conductance. Th these are items that we've certainly studied a lot of in 108 and 109 as well as alternating current because that is... Uh, generated electricity that, that you're going to use in industry and you're going to find in your house. Direct current, we've talked about batteries. Now, when we talked about reactance and, and impedance, <laughs> um, now we're getting away from resistance. We're talking about the effect of uh, alternating current when you have inductance um, and capacitors. And that uh, is going to be in a, a little more advanced math class that you're going to learn. But for now, we we're just expecting you to understand reactance impedance. Um, power and kilowatt hour, th those are once again items that uh, we, we've we already been over, but the definitions have been provided to you. You'll want to memorize them. <clears throat> we're going to do one more Ohm's Law here. So um, you can go ahead and pause this and uh, do the Ohm's Law practice video. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, you're finished. Uh, hopefully, it was just a little bit of review. Maybe you picked up a few things about ladder logic. So you're going to go ahead and turn in your completed lecture video worksheet to the lab instructor. Um, they're going to review it, be sure it's complete, and then uh, they can issue your lab materials and you can move uh, move forward. <coughs>